of little else, and who could blame them? What happened in a remote corner of Crawford County created a legacy that lives to this day. This week on Forum 16, we'll journey back to the development and discovery days in the Crawford County oil fields, and we'll meet some Crawford County folks who are working to keep this legacy alive. Stay tuned. Addressing issues, places, and events that affect southeastern Illinois, this is Forum 16. Welcome to Forum 16. I'm Barry Waters. I was just practicing what the old oil explorers called creekology, and what you do is you get down in the creek bottom and you look for evidence like sand or coal that would give you an indication of what the rock structures are like underneath the ground. And that would tell them if there was a chance of finding oil here or not. In 1905, two such explorers, Michael Benenden and Joseph Trees, came to Crawford County. In Robinson, they met Judge William C. Jones, who for years had believed a large amount of natural resources lay hidden beneath Crawford County. Having tried and failed at drilling for oil, Judge Jones concluded what was needed here were oil experts. In Benendum and Trees, he had at long length found the men to fulfill his vision and dream. By July of 1905, the Benendum Trees Oil Company had secured leases on 50,000 acres of Crawford County land at 10 cents an acre, and were drilling here on what was then the Robert Athey Farm. When they pulled the tools from the hole on August 5th, the oil shot some 40 feet into the air, and the Illinois oil boom was on. And the rest, as they say, is history. And history, at least the preservation of oil field history, is what this program is all about. The town of Oblong, which was a center of activity during oil boom days, has been the home for some 30 years of the only oil field museum in Illinois, one of only six in the United States. Phil Boyd is the president of the board of directors of the Oil Field Museum Foundation. The Oblong Oil Field Museum was dedicated in 1961. It was the vision of one man, Enos Bloom, a longtime village employee and the president of our Chamber of Commerce at that time. It was his vision to preserve a lot of this oil field equipment that was instrumental in the development of Crawford County. We have many exhibits in the yard outside the museum here. We have several old gasoline pumps, an old pulling unit, some old derricks, and a lot of old oil field engines. The museum is located in the village park in Oblong. It's real easy to find. The really neat stuff at the museum is located inside. Here inside the museum, there are a lot of interesting pieces, whether or not you have some affiliation with the oil industry or if you're just a history buff who enjoys looking at old artifacts. We have some wooden plugs that were used to plug the wells back in the old days. We have a lot of the old nitroglycerin shells that were used to shoot the wells. We've got core samples. We've got photographs and books. We've got miniature uh, powerhouses that actually work. And we have an old tank wagon from the Marathon Oil Company, formerly the Ohio Oil Company. And these are just a few of the things that you can see in the Oblong Oil Field Museum. It really is true what Phil says about the museum being chock full of interesting artifacts in the old oil field days. Take this old wooden well plug, for example. Even more interesting are some of the people you might meet while you're here visiting the museum. Some of these folks are preserving the legacy of the Crawford County oil field in their own way. They work the fields using traditional methods. One such person is Mike Irvin, a well driller by trade. I got started in the oil business back in 80, 81. I didn't start off with this rig. I bought a small lease north of town. Didn't know a thing about it. Had no idea what was going on. Had a friend that was in the business that he sort of helped me along. That lease panned out pretty good. I drilled two wells on it, but I hired a rotary to drill it. 
Then I drilled three or four more with rotaries. I had to hire it down because I didn't have any equipment. And I got to talking to Bill Rector, a friend of mine, and he drilled with cable tool. And I went out with him a few times, watching him how to run it, and so he sold me this one. Never been on a rig before in my life. Never drilled with one. I took it out, me and a friend of mine started drilling wells. It took us a while to learn what we was doing, but uh, Bill helped us. He gave us pointers on how to do things, and uh, we caught on pretty good. I imagine I've drilled 40 to 50 wells with this old rig. about 86 and the bottom fell out of oil prices. I drilled every day, every day of the year, I had wells to drill. And now I just drill in the summertime, I drill two or three wells a year. Because things are so slow and uh, not that much profit in it. Well, I'll give you an idea of how they used to drill wells back in the 30s. They used a rig similar to this. This is a Bosiris 24. And, uh, Come on the market, I'd say in the early 30s, maybe middle 30s. Uh, there's not too many of them around anymore. Uh, not very many people drill like this anymore. Me and two other guys in the county is all I know of, and I'm the youngest one. The other two guys are getting some age on them. So this is a sort of a dying art. Not too many people know how to do it. off drilling with a stem like this, but you got a bigger bit, you got a 10 inch bit. You run, <clears throat> drill a 10 inch hole down to around, oh, I think 68 foot, what I drilled here. And inside that hole you run in eight inch casing, which that shuts off all your surface water, your cavings if you have any, and keeps your hole dry. Then you go in with an eight inch bit, is what I'm drilling now, an eight inch hole. It's similar like this. These are button bits. And you drill down to about 400, 450 foot. After that, uh, you run in seven inch casing, which is there on the rack back here. And that keeps your water shut off and your hole from caving in on you. It's hard to drill these holes when they're full of water. It just does, they just don't want to drill. After you run your seven inch pipe, you go in and with your six, and a half, six and a quarter inch bit and tools, you drill on down to the uh, pay zone, which uh, around here is about 920 to 950. And there's a deeper pay, about a thousand foot. So you drill from four or five hundred foot to the TD, that's the bottom depth, with your six and a half inch bit. If you hit oil, you run in four and a half casing. If you don't hit oil, you plug it. time. That gives me the idea of how much I've drilled and if the baler doesn't go down from the last mark you have hole trouble. In other words your hole's crooked or it's square and you have to fix it. And the way you fix it is you fill it back up 
five, ten foot with uh, rock, then you re-drill it, which takes time, but you have to do it. Then there's other things that happen while you're drilling that people don't realize. You might break your cable, lose your tools in the hole, lose your stem in the hole, get hung in the hole, and all this is, that's when the work starts. Sitting here drilling is not really that bad because you're just running the machine. But you get hung in the hole, you lose your tools, and you're talking work. what keeps me out here drilling with one of these things. I'd love to hit one of those gushers like the, in the old days. Back in 1906 when they first discovered this field, they had wells flow. As soon as you drill into it, here it come. All over the derrick, all over everything. That's what I'm looking for. I think if I ever hit one of them, I quit. Because uh, that'd be a dream come true. It's never happened yet, and it probably never will, but uh, maybe it will. faces a variety of challenges every day. So too has the museum board faced challenges. As you can see, there's not much room for new exhibits, and this building isn't getting any younger. Phil Boyd explains some of the problems and challenges that the board now faces. Here at the Albion Royal Field Museum, we've outgrown our present facility. A lot of the old photographs, due to the lack of climate control in the facility have have deteriorated and they're in a very poor state now. A lot of the books too, a lot of the books are just covered with dust and have been subjected to the weather as well. A lot of people have said to us that they would like to donate books, pictures, and memorabilia to the museum, but they're concerned that it won't be preserved. A lot of our exhibits outside the museum really are deteriorating the worst due to being exposed to the weather constantly. The old wooden derricks are showing a lot of weathering. The wood is crum crumbling. A lot of the old pumps and engines are showing a lot of rust from being out in the weather all the time. We hope that with our new facility, both the memorabilia inside the museum and the outdoor exhibits will be better preserved. As Phil mentioned earlier, the oil field museum contains several working models. This one in particular caught my eye. This model of a powerhouse demonstrates the way in which oil was pumped in the old days. As we learned from Mike Irvin, some of the old ways of oil field work are still in practice. We met another man out in the oil fields of Crawford County who continues to do his job as it was done years ago. We're still operating here like they were back in the early 1900s. This is on my great-grandfather's property. And it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's been more or less in the family. This is, this has run since about 1909. It's run pretty steady since then. Hello, I'm, I'm Keith Tohill, and we're going to be taking a tour of the early oil field days. In the background, you'll notice what sounds like a dog barking continuously is the powerhouse, that is the central power, one big engine that's controlling all the wells. We're pumping nine wells on this power right now. The power that you hear in the background is a 19, about a 25. It's a copy of a Superior engine, which was made at Bridgeport, Illinois. And the reason it was made down here at Bridgeport the Ohio Oil Company years ago had so many of the Superior engines. When Superior went out of business, they set up a foundry at Bridgeport and produced these engines themselves down at Bridgeport. 
this is a 35 horse engine that's, that's running in the background. In the back of the power on the eccentric is an 18 foot mascot band wheel. Most of that wheel is wood and it's still all original. It's been running from, since about 1909. And there's about 120 feet of belt on it, 10 inch belt, four ply belt. And there's a centric on that, which offsets each well. Our longest rod line or well from the power is probably a quarter of a mile, a little over. We have nine of them on it. And it's operating off of its own gas. We accumulate all the gas off from the casing heads of the engine. Nothing is flared. We don't waste any gas. And that supplies the, the power to run the engine. We have a pond down here in the woods that supplies the water for the engine, fresh water. The maintenance on the engine is very little. And the last 15 years, we've re replaced exhaust valve twice and the intake valve four or five times. The set of rings runs 35 years, constant. And it takes about a quart and a half of oil to lubricate it a day. And once in a while we'll have trouble with a spark plug, not too often, but it's pretty much maintenance free. We figure we save around $1,000 a month electric by operating the power. How many years? daily pretty much so and we can change the direction we can run a rod line any direction that we want to run it we can change the stroke of the pump in any way that we want to run it one benefit of this power is the pumper can go to the power here and he can tell whatever one of his wells is done without going out to the well he can uh, know by the feel of the rod line whether the well is pounding fluid whether it's pumping down right or not you can pretty much tell a good pumper can exactly what's going on right here but at the power. In the background here is the tank battery. There's, the tanks are stored inside of a shed just like they used to be. And to the back of it here in the big riveted tank, that is a separator tank. That's where all the wells are pumping into and oil's been separated there. The other huge wooden tank behind it is where the water is collected and from there it goes to a disposal system. These are 100 barrel tanks in, inside of the building here. There's four 100 barrel tanks in there. 
their wooden, their uh, redwood and cypress tanks. They were constructed right here on the site, built right here and been here ever since. And years ago, all of this oil right, right here was loaded on the railroad, which is behind us, the old New York Central. There was a steam engine set right out here, and, and all the oil was loaded then back on the railroad track. After, after they done away with the railroad, the Ohio Oil Company put in a gathering system, but since then that was, that's been done away with, and everything is trucked out now. We showed you these nitroglycerin torpedoes earlier, and maybe you thought then, what in the heck were those for? After some of the wells were dug, a collecting pool had to be created at the bottom of the well before they could be pumped. This was accomplished by detonating a large charge of nitroglycerin at the bottom of the well. These sh well shooters must have been a special breed, for the newspapers of the time talk about nitroglycerin factory explosions, near catastrophes during transportation, and of well shooter heroics on top of the oil derricks. When the derrick is built and the well is drilled to the oil sand down below, they stand around for the guy who's skilled in helping the oil to flow. For it may be big and it may be not, but you can't most always tell until after the nitro charge is shot by the fellow who shoots the well. He's a nitroglycerin Johnny with a kind of breezy way. The smile of the scamp is bonny and the talk of the lad is gay. To care, he seems a stranger and you never on earth could tell that he works in deathly danger at this fellow who shoots the well. His wagon, it rattles across the hills and it makes you hold your breath and it gives you a lovely set of chills when you think of his load of death. With that nitroglycerin slopping about and him is singing free Though he knows if the canvas stuff fell out, he'd muss up the scenery. He's a nitroglycerin kiddo, and he's got to keep his wits, or he'll leave his wife a widow to a lot of scattered bits. He needs a head that's level and a nerve you can't dispel, and he mustn't fear man or devil, this man who shoots the well. He lowers those long torpedoes through the hole the drill has made, and you notice he does it carefully too, for his job is a risky trade. Then he lets that big iron devil drop and he runs like Billy Hill. And a geyser climbs to the derrick top and you know he's shot the well. And whether the well is splendid or a kind of piddling one, his part of the work is ended, his share of the job is done. With his lips a whistling happy and his hat cocked on his knob, this nitroglycerin chappy moves on to another job. At one time, this model was on display at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Residing as it does now in the Oblong Oil Field Museum is proof that the museum board wants the museum to grow and continue to offer visitors a complete view of the oil field history. To me, this is a fitting tribute to the vision of Enos Bloom. Phil Boyd explains how you can help. About three years ago, a group of concerned citizens formed a not-for-profit foundation to help preserve a lot of the artifacts here and to look into the possibility of building a new facility. Mayor Tom Rogers and City Councilman Rick Hardyshell were two individuals that initiated that foundation. And the foundation's been able to do some good things. The foundation has been able to re-photograph literally hundreds of old photographs here that had yellowed with age, and in that way have been able to preserve those photographs. The foundation also raised funds to purchase five acres of ground right on Route 33, just at the west edge of town, that we hope someday is the site of our new museum facility, a place that will adequately preserve all the artifacts and memorabilia that we have. How can you help? Well, we would appreciate any donations that you could give us, but possibly the greatest help, or the best thing that you could do for us, would be to write to your legislators and tell them to support the Oilfield Museum Foundation project in Oblong, Illinois. We hope that the new museum will have exhibits from all counties in the Illinois Basin and will represent all of Southern Illinois and not just Crawford County. Another thing to consider is that there are only six or seven oil field museums in the entire United States and only one in Illinois. And we think it's worth preserving our oil heritage.
Many people in southern Illinois have already donated either funds or memorabilia to our museum and to our foundation. And to those people, we just want to say the project is still very much alive and we appreciate your support. Legend has it that this oil well here was located by the toss of an empty whiskey bottle. However the site was determined, the Shire number no. 1 came in at 2,500 barrels a day. Hundreds of wells were drilled, and soon Illinois was the third leading oil producing state in the country. Several fortunes were made and lost, but the lives of the people in Crawford County were changed forever. The Oblong Oil Field Museum is a treasure trove of oil field memorabilia. But it not only houses and preserves the artifacts of old oil field days, it preserves the legacy and the vision and the dreams of men like William C. Jones, Mike Benendam, and Enos Bloom. For Forum 16, I'm Barry Waters. Thank mm -hmm. you.